Some good, some good memories come to my mind every time I hear that song, Precious Memories, and so thank the Lord for that. Well, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 11, the Bible says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Romans 8, verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, who are the called according to His purposes. I'll tell you something. Our God is a sovereign God. He is a God who knows the end from the beginning. And even when we can't understand what God's doing, what we know about God is that He's good and He knows what He's doing. And if there's anything that we've learned this year with our theme, but God, it has been that God is good and that God is sovereign. And even when we don't like what He's allowing us to go through, Oftentimes, through the biggest messes of our life, God creates the best masterpieces for His glory. I'm so thankful for that here today. This song right here was introduced to me by one of our late and dear members who passed away two years ago this month, Donita Jones. And it was weeks before she passed away when she uh, introduced this song to us. We sat in her living room she was sitting there and they played this song and we just all wept together and cried as we thought about God's good and his purposes are good even if we don't understand them. I'm glad that we can trust that. You know, this Christmas may have just been downright horrible for you. It might have been lonely. You might have had just horrible things going on in your family. Maybe not even able to gather with your family. You might be in financial crisis. You might be in a low point right now. But God sees where you're at. And I tell you, God has good plans for you if you'll trust Him. He's taking you somewhere. You can trust Him. We're going to sing about this truth in this next song. And I hope you'll let this truth minister to your heart as we sing it together. Let's all stand together and sing this song. Let's sing on that first verse together. There is strength. There is strength within. There is beauty in our tears. Sing it with your heart. And you meet us in our morning. With a love that has no fear. You are working in our waiting. You're sanctified. 
good in His glory. Let's sing about that together. You may be seated at this time, and as our worship team comes down to join us here, I want to uh, encourage you to uh, take out your Bibles and uh, go with me in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Turn to the book of Proverbs this morning, and we'll be there in just a moment, the book of Proverbs together this morning.
blessing that is to think about the fact that our Savior, the promised one, has come to us. And uh, that's a message that has been on my heart all of this week. And I sure am thankful uh, for that truth. Let's get this thing on here. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. There you go. Some of you still say no. Well, turn up your hearing aids. No, I'm just kidding with you. Um, Proverbs is why I'd like to invite you in your Bibles this morning. And I'll be honest with you. I prepared all week and had every intention to preach a message to you from Luke chapter 2 this morning. And God did it again. Um, he switched things up on me. And I do believe it's what the Lord wants for this hour. I've said this before when he changes the message before I come to the pulpit. Um, I, I just get a little frustrated because I work so hard on the other message and then God changes it. Um, but, you know, there's just some uh, circumstances that happened this morning that made it, the Lord made it very clear um, that uh, he didn't want me to preach uh, the message I was going to preach this morning from Luke chapter number two. But suffice it to say, the final hallelujah we see in the scripture is from Simeon, a man named Simeon in Luke chapter two. And the reason that he said hallelujah is because he was living in anticipation of the Messiah coming into this world. And when he saw his Messiah come, he said, Hallelujah. And if you turn to Revelation chapter 19, uh, not right now, but if you turn there, uh, you'll find out that we as believers one day, when we see our Messiah, Jesus Christ in heaven, are going to join together in a great throne and throughout eternity sing, Hallelujah, to Jesus Christ our Messiah. And... Uh, so there's the message in a nutshell. Don't you wish I could preach all the messages that simply? <laughs> but today the Lord's put it on my heart to speak to you from Proverbs chapter 15. And we'll be in Proverbs chapter 17 uh, as well. If you'd like to turn specifically to Proverbs chapter 15 is where we'll be at. And as I was, as, as I was praying and seeking the Lord this morning, there were just several circumstances um, the Lord put this in my heart that I needed to preach this. And I said, no, no, I've already prepared another message, Lord. And uh, then he'd do, then he bring another circumstance that just confirmed it in my heart. This is where we need to be at here uh, this morning. Proverbs chapter number 15. Around this time of year, something we often say to each other is Merry Christmas. right? And uh, at least in a conservative rural town like this, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, typical for us to say Merry Christmas. Um, some people might rather say happy holidays, but we are not among that group. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and I'm not getting political on you. I just like to say Jesus around Christmas time. Christmas. Uh, it's what it's really all about. And you know, the, the truth is uh, we say Mary, but I don't think a lot of us really understand what it really means to be married. In fact, if we described what our year has been like, and specifically this season of Christmas has been like, perhaps it would be anything but Mary. Where our hearts have been at here today. And maybe you're in that place today. If I were to ask you what it means to be married, what would you say? You know what it really means to be married? It has nothing to do with Santa Claus uh, uh, laughing and jiggling, okay? That's oftentimes what we associate with Merry Christmas, but it really has nothing to do with that. And I think the Lord wants us to focus on this thought here this morning about what it means to be Mary. A modern definition defines the word Mary in this way. It says to be full of cheerfulness, joyous in disposition of spirit, or laughingly happy. All right. I like that last definition the best. Laughingly happy. That's what it means to be Mary. And we often associate, and this secular dictionary defines being Mary as being happy. But the Bible reveals to us true merriness has to do with so much more than just a happy feeling. To be merry is not just a feeling. Now, when you are merry, make no doubt about it, you will have a feeling in your heart. But merriness does not, true merriness, true happiness does not come from the circumstances that we find ourselves in, but from the scripture. From what we understand about the scripture. And that's where we're going to turn to uh, help us understand a little bit better about what it really means to be married. Being married is a condition of your heart more than anything else. And that's wherein the problem lies for many of us when it comes to our struggle with actually being married. A person can put on a, a merry face 
on the outside and appeared to be so, but true merriness does not come from your outward expressions. It comes from your heart. The Bible makes this very clear. The merriness of our heart, as we'll see as we study the scripture today, it really comes from our relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've got Jesus in your heart, you can have joy. You can have true merriness, no matter what circumstance you find yourself in. We're going to see that from the scripture today. But notice what the Bible tells us first here in Proverbs chapter number 15 and verse number 13. Let's read this verse out loud together. Are you ready? A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. Go down to verse number 15. Let's read it together. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Go to chapter 17, if you would, and verse number 22. And let's read this one out loud together. And begin. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. A broken spirit drieth the bones. The Bible gives us some wonderful definitions of what it really means to be merry. <laughs> Before we say Merry Christmas, let's think about what it really means to be merry. I want you to search your own heart this morning. Search your own life and ask if there's something lacking there as we study these truths together this morning. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Our Father, we come before you. And as we bow, Lord, I, I know that this is something that you uh, have impressed upon my heart and not let me escape. And uh, Lord, I pray, God, that you'd use the message for the hour. This is a truth that... You have spoken to me about many times. And uh, God, I pray that the condition of our heart would be evaluated today. Lord, if there's something lacking there, or perhaps for some of us even something missing there, a true relationship with Jesus Christ, I pray today would be the day that uh, that begins to be turned. That our hearts will be turned to you afresh and anew. For those that don't know you as Savior, that they might receive you into their lives so they can truly know what joy is. It's Jesus. Now I pray, God, you bless this time we'll spend in the scriptures together today. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So what does the Bible really mean when it tells us to be merry? We've just seen some definitions given to us here in the scripture. And I want to give you three descriptions based on these um, passages of scripture on what it means to be merry. If you're taking notes, you can write this first one down. A merry heart is contagiously conspicuous. Now, I don't have anything on the screen for you here today, so you're just going to have to get your phone out and look up some of these, okay? No, I'm just kidding with you. But a merry heart is contagiously conspicuous. Now, after 2020, the idea of being contagious took a whole different meaning for us, didn't it? All right, everybody's freaked out about a virus that is contagious. Well, most viruses are contagious, okay? But I laid that aside. Again, I'm not going to get into that because you're all going to get mad at me if I get into that kind of stuff here today, all right? But we understand the idea of what it means to be contagious. And the Bible says in Proverbs 15 and verse 13, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. When you are merry, when you are truly merry, it will unequivocally result in you being cheerful and appearing to be so. All right? Uh, it's not just that you are cheerful. It's that, you know, you, you come up to some people and, are you happy? Yeah, I'm happy. Uh, I'm not talking about that, okay? Uh, some people have a hard time even putting on the show of being cheerful. Um, I'm talking about a genuine cheerfulness will result from you having this merriness the Bible talks about in your heart. And so uh, 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 the word merry here in this verse, it, it is a Hebrew word that means to be joyful or to be glad. Or we could put it this way, to show joy from your heart. And that's uh, what the Bible is talking about in this verse right here when it talks about being merry. And so when a person experiences true merriness, what the Bible is saying here is that it will show forth on their face. Now, I've been privileged to know several merry people in my life. All right? One of uh, my favorite ones to talk about is my grandma, Tiny. All right? Now, her name was Gladys. She didn't like the name Gladys. And so she asked everyone to call her Tiny. She was a very tall woman. Um, and so she liked the idea of being tiny. Uh, never heard, I never heard of a lady that wanted to be called tiny. And boy, you could just be around her. And she was a happy person. 
And uh, you, I grew up in a, in a town called Martinsville. If you went around Martinsville and sat down anywhere, just about anywhere you'd go, you'd meet somebody who knew my grandma. And uh, she just brought joy into people's lives. I think all of us have somebody that we know that is like that. Uh, she had a contagious laugh. Uh, she just, uh, it was her, it was, she, it was her uh, greatest joy to make other people smile. And uh, one of the things that was contagious about her laugh is uh, she would snort when she laughed. We got any snorters in here today? All right, go ahead and fess up. All right, there you are. We got some snorters in here. You never snort while I'm preaching. What's up with that? Uh, but anyways, you're not funny. Okay, I'm sorry. But she would. She snored when she laughed. And that was, that was part of what made it so contagious. She was called hog around town because she snorted while she laughed. And so she'd come in a room, and I'd oftentimes go with Grandma somewhere, and, they, and she'd walk in the room, and, and someone would say, How are you doing, you old hog? And uh, interesting thing to call a woman, I think. But uh, uh, she loved it. And uh, that was something about my grandma. I'll never forget about it. I can't wait to see her one day in heaven again because she was just contagiously conspicuous about her joy, about this merriness in her heart. And boy, there are people in this church I could talk about. You're the same way. I get around you and I always leave a little bit happier than I was when I, when I came to the conversation. And the Bible says when you've got true joy in your heart, that's the type of uh, uh, effect it'll have on your face. And it's more than just your face. It's your countenance. It's your lifestyle. You'll live your life with joy. You'll live your life with this uh, uh, contagiously conspicuous merriness coming from your heart. And so when a person is truly merry uh, in their heart, it will result in showing on their face. The Bible says that of the abundance of our hearts, our mouths speak. What you have in here will eventually come out here and here as well. Your countenance will eventually show what's going on in your heart. Your speech will eventually show what's going on in your heart. And I ask you, what's been showing on your face this past week? Anger, bitterness, I hate people. No. <laughs> There's been joy. What has been showing from your face and from your lips and your family gatherings this past week? The Bible says when you have a merry heart, it results in a cheerful countenance. Take your Bibles if you would like to and go over to Acts chapter 6 with me this morning. Now keep your place there in Proverbs because we're coming back, but let's turn over to Acts chapter 6. And this cheerful countenance, I'll say before we read this verse, does not necessitate good circumstances in your life. You can have a joyful heart and countenance regardless of what's going on in your life. In Acts chapter 6, there's a story about the first martyr of the church. His name was Stephen. And this man is about to be stoned to death, about to be martyred for his faith in Christ. Yet even as those things were taking place, look at Acts chapter 6 and verse Number 15, the Bible says, And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been what? The face of an angel. Now, I'll tell you something. I've never looked at a man's face and said, boy, he looks like an angel. All right? That's not what I was talking about here. Not in our, not in our, idea, not in our idea of thinking of it. But now I looked at, looked at his face, and there's just such a peace, such a joy. Such a confidence that was on his face when he looked at him, even though he's about to be tried and condemned and murdered for his faith. He had that joy in the midst of difficult circumstances. And you can too, when you have the joy of Jesus welling up in your heart. And so because a merry heart is so conspicuous, that's why I believe it is so contagious. Um, when you truly have this, this joy in your life, uh, it'll spread to people who are around you. And so have you ever realized um, the contagiousness of, of, of joy? It makes me think about the fact that anytime a person smiles, you know a smile is contagious, right? There you go. Some of you smile. Some of you were frowning at me intentionally. Thank you for that. Oh, no. But smile is contagious. You can walk in a room and smile, and it just can't, you can't help but get somebody else to want to join along with you on that. It's just something contagious about a cheerful countenance, and even more so when it's coming from someone who genuinely has joy in their heart. Now, I, uh, some of the best friends that I have in this world are people who I enjoy spending time with because they have this kind of uh, conspicuous, contagious joy in their hearts. And I'll tell you something, it's a valuable thing to have a person like that in your life. 
You ought to strive to be that type of person for the people who are in your lives as well. Your lives as well. And I believe that's something uh, of a challenge for us here today. And so the Bible says at the beginning of this verse, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. But let's read the last part of the verse, Proverbs 15 and verse 13. It says, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Diametrically opposed to a merry heart, the Bible says, is one who has a sorrowful heart. Have you ever met somebody who seemingly had the gift to suck the joy out of any situation they were in? <laughs> Don't point at them, okay? <laughs> That's not fair. Uh, some people seem to have a spiritual gift for sucking joy and happiness out of any type of circumstance. We might call him a Grinch. I don't know what we would call him. That reminds me of the story I heard about a disgruntled pre preacher who was on his way to a graveside burial service uh, at the cemetery. And, uh, he was going there to do a service for, um, uh, it was an, he was an indignant man, he had no family, he had no friends. And, um, and so he's going to the service and on his way there he got lost on his way there and he couldn't find the place. And the time came when the service was supposed to take place and the time passed and he still hadn't gotten there. And boy, it was about an hour after it was supposed to take place. He pulls up to the cemetery. He, 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 he gets out of his car and he goes up to the place where uh, there was a, a hole dug out in the ground and he stands behind, beside that hole and he began, uh, you know, he didn't want to dishonor the man. And so he began to give the most passionate, fiery message that he possibly could as he was standing beside that hole. And he ended his sermon, he prayed and ended his sermon, and he walked away. And as he returned to his car, he overheard some workers that he supposed were from the cemetery standing beside, uh, around that, that area, uh, talking about him as he's walking to the car. And one of the men said, you know, I've been putting septic tanks in for 20 years. <laughs> I never seen anything like that. <laughs> That was for you, Dale, all right? Yeah. <laughs> I think about that preacher, and I think about somebody who can suck the joy out of any situation. Some people seem to have a gift for it, but friend, when you have the joy of Jesus in your heart, you won't help but be able to show it to the people who are around you in your life. The angel said, when Jesus came, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. When you've got that joy of Jesus who's come to save you in your heart, you won't be able to help but share it with other people who are in your life. And friend, whenever you get discouraged, whenever you get into a place of having a sorrowful heart, you need to bring yourself back to a place of remembering who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you. And the joy will begin to shine in your heart once again. You have that joy in your heart here today. The Bible says in Psalm 84, verse number 4, Blessed are they that dwell in your house. They will still be praising thee. You know, when you dwell with the Lord, you'll never, never lack for a reason to have this joy in your heart. Whether you're about to be martyred like Stephen was, or whether everything's honky door in your life and going just fine, you'll always have a reason to have this joy from in your heart and therefore showing on your face. And so has your face forgotten the reason that your heart has to have joy? All right, that's I watch some of you sing. Some of you need to remind yourself when you sing about the joy of Jesus, okay? I'm serious about this. Uh, we, can, we can belittle a circumstance like this. We can belittle having joy in our life. We can just settle that we're always going to be grumpy old men or grumpy old women. Or we can determine we're going to be Christ-like Christians and have the joy of Christ in our heart and reflecting in our life. So how, how does the Bible say you can truly be merry? Number one, a merry heart is con uh, contagiously conspicuous. Number two... A merry heart is continually content. Continually content. Now take your Bibles, go to Proverbs 15 and verse number 15. If you're there, say amen. amen. Proverbs 15, verse 15. The Bible tells us, And all the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart has a continual feast. He that is of a merry heart has a continual feast. I think it's interesting the verse starts off with saying, All the days of the afflicted are evil. Right? Some of us, it doesn't matter if it was a good day. It's still a bad day. You know what I'm saying? This can't, you, you can find the negative in any certain situation of life. That's not a good disposition. That's not a Christ-like attitude to have in your life. Um, how was your Christmas? Bad. Why? I had to spend it with my family. 
I didn't get enough presents. I, I had kids tell me that before. You can come up with a negative. You, you can come up with a negative. So long as you live in this evil world, you'll be able to come up with negatives. Right. All the days will be afflicted or evil. You know, you never had a good day in your life. You got evil in your heart. When you know Jesus, the Bible says there at the end of that verse, he that has a merry heart has a what? A continuous feast. A continuous feast. You'll never lack for a reason to have joy in your heart when you have Jesus. That's essentially what the Bible's saying here. So when you have a merry heart, it will result in your being content. You will be blessed with what God has given to you. This word Mary in this verse is different than the word Mary that was used in the previous verse. This word Mary in the Hebrew, it means to be good or to be pleasant or agreeable. And so this merriness is not so much the result of how much you get what you, how much you get, uh, what you wish you had, but it is the result of how much you understand what you have been given. That's where this merriness comes from. You're not, you don't get this merriness when you get the thing you think you want. You get this merriness when you're content with the things that God has already given to you. That's what this merriness comes from. It uh, uh, reminds me, I was having a conversation not too long ago with somebody about their life. And they just began to talk about um, how good God had been to them. They began to talk about uh, how they, they got to grow up in a Christian home. And, uh, and so because of that, they, they, they didn't make a lot of the mistakes that a lot of young people make with with living in sin and, and, and going after these kinds of things. And they just began to thank, uh, thank God in the conversation we were having for their parents and, and for their upbringing and how God preserved them from so much trouble that they could have had. And as I listened to them talking about these things, my heart was reminded of the fact that these were truly merry people. These people were so overcome with how good God had been to them and what God had already given to them. Can I say that's a form of merriness? Right. Just being so thankful and so content with what God has already given you. It's not about, well, I don't have what I think I want. It's about, God, thank you. You have blessed me more than I deserve. Amen. That's a heart of merriness. That's what the Bible's talking about. And friend, when you have that, even when things do go wrong, you can look around and say, well, that thing's wrong, but boy, God's given me all of this. Amen. Hallelujah. God's been good to me. That's, that's what your source of joy comes from. You can have it in any situation. All your days are evil. When you've got Jesus in your life and you recognize how good Jesus has been to you, you have a continual feast when you know Christ is in your life. The Bible tells us that a truly merry person is continually feasting on the blessings that God has given them in their lives. They're always remembering the reasons they have to be joyful because of what God has done in their lives I don't know about you, but one of the things that I always do around the holidays, and this isn't a good thing, it's not a thing that I recommend to you, um, but it's the time of year when, uh, around our house, when I was growing up, and even today, um, my mother and now my wife, they like to make all of these snacks. I'm talking about, how many ever had puppy chow? I'm not talking about literal puppy chow, okay? I'm talking about stuff you can eat, all right? Uh, peanut brittle, all right? Uh, what are some of the snacks we eat during this time of year, huh? Yeah, all of that. Whatever y'all just said, I can understand. <laughs> y'all have your own, okay? Well, I loved it when I was growing up, especially because those snacks were around, and it just seemed like we would never stop eating the whole day. You know what I'm talking about? Um, it's just having that continual feast. And that just reminds me of, of this joy, this merriness the Bible's talking about that we can have. God has given, he spread out the table on the counter. You've got your puppy child. You've got your peanut brittle. You've got all the things that God has blessed you with. And friend, whenever you want, you can go up and take a little taste of that. Boy, it'll taste and see that the Lord is good, the Bible tells us. That's where your, that's where your merriness truly comes from. Now, I'll tell you something. It's not good to eat all those snacks practically and get fat doing it, all right? But it's good to get fat spiritually, all right? It's good to feast on that stuff and enjoy the goodness of God in your life. And that's where true merriness comes from. And so I wonder, from your heart and in your life today, if you're truly merry, if you're truly content with what God has blessed you with. Friend, if you're not content with what God has blessed you with, all your days are going to be evil. Right. It's never going to be good enough. Right. Well, God gave me this, but he still hasn't given me this. And no matter what good God does, you're never going to be happy until you have what you think you want. 
When instead, if you would just appreciate what God has already blessed you with, you could have more joy than if you got the thing you think you wanted. It's one of the paradoxes of Scripture, but it really is a key to experiencing true joy in your heart here today. So I wonder, I wonder if you have this merriness in your heart. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse, verse number 6, that godliness with contentment is great gain. Boy, when you have the Lord, and you're content with having the Lord. There's nothing better that you can get in your life than that right there. So I wonder which camp you fall in here today. Are you have the camp where you can find the negative in any circumstance of your life, or even if you're going through negative right now, you can find merriness in what God has already blessed you with. Be better to us than what we deserve. What does it mean to be merry? Well, the first thing that we've seen here today is being merry. A merry heart is contagiously conspicuous. The second thing is that a merry heart is continually content. But the final thing I want you to see here this morning will be done is that a merry heart is correctively curative, or it is a cure to your life. It is a healing balm to your soul. Go to Proverbs chapter 17 with me. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. I'm going to start jumping up and down and clapping my hands, doing jumping jacks. Y'all are tired after Christmas. You've been feasting on too many Christmas snacks. You should have brought it with you. All right? Um, <laughs> no, don't do that. But Proverbs chapter 17 and verse number 22, the Bible says, A merry heart doeth good like a what? Like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. When you have a merry heart, the Bible is saying here that it will result in being the cure to whatever issues are going on around you in your life. When you have this merry heart, your merry heart can either be a cure uh, to your circumstances, or your merry heart can be a cure to the circumstances that someone else is going through as well. It's not just about you being happy. It's about you spreading the joy that the Lord has put in your heart to other people who need that joy in their lives as well. And that's what this, I believe the, this verse is referring to both of those circumstances here. So how uh, many times have you and I, while, while going through a difficult time, had someone help us find our smile again? How many times have you had somebody who the Lord sent in your life when you were downtrodden, when you were uh, 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 backslidden, when you were discouraged, when you were depressed, the Lord sent that one person along to you who encouraged you in the Lord, who brought hope to your heart again, who helped you process your grief. How many times has God brought that person into your life? I know for me it's been many times. I think that's something the Word of God is referring for us here. There have been several times when I've, I've had a difficult week and God will bring somebody into my life and maybe they tell me a joke or maybe they tell me something foolish that they've done that week. And boy, they just make me laugh. You know those, kind of those times in life when you, you start laughing so hard you start crying? All right, some of you, you pee your pants, you laugh so hard. I love to talk about that, you know. That's what I'm talking about. Boy, there have been some times that that happened to me and then I'll get done laughing. It's just one of those really good belly laughs. You know what I'm talking about? And you get done, and then you just think, wow, it's been a long time. It's been a long time since I laugh like that. I always appreciate those moments. I always appreciate those times when God brings someone like that into my life. Sometimes he does it during times when I, I didn't even realize I needed it. I didn't realize how, how bad I had gotten in my spirit. Boy, I love those types of circumstances when God brings them to pass in my life. I think that all of us need that. A merry heart can do more to heal the sorrows and burdens of our lives than anything else that this world has to offer to us. You can have counseling. You can go through seminars. You can have a, a psychiatrist try to treat, treat your situation. You can do a whole lot of things that the world tells you to do, but the Bible just indicates to us that a merry heart is the best medicine. The best medicine for your soul. In the study called The Anatomy of an Illness, as perceived by the patient, Norman Cousins tells of being hospitalized with a rare and crippling disease. When he was diagnosed as incurable, Cousins checked out of the hospital. And aware of the harmful effects that negative emotions could have on the body, Cousins reasoned the reverse was true. So he borrowed a movie projector 
and prescribed his own treatment consisting of Marx Brother films and old candid camera reruns. Well, some of you don't even know what that is. <laughs> I do. We watch the old shows, all right? And it didn't take long for him to discover that 10 minutes of laughter provided two hours of pain-free sleep for him. Amazingly, his debilitating, debilitating disease was eventually reversed. He was told that he had an incurable, incurable, incurable disease, he wouldn't survive, and so he prescribed his own treatment, laughter, joy. Wouldn't you know when he overcame the thing? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, like a healing balm. That phrase, doeth good, it literally implies that it is pleasing like a medicine, right? Um, and uh, there's, there's this cold that's uh, been going around here lately, and some of you, how many of you have gotten the cold that's been going around here lately? You're not going to admit to it, okay? I think that many of us probably have over this past fall and early winter. You don't want to you fess up. You're going to make me get tested. Why are you making me raise my hand? But anyways, um, uh, it's been going around, and I, I tell you, every time I get a cold, I... Uh, I, love, I, I love to be able to go down to the store and, uh, and get some medicine. Boy, you take that medicine and it's just like, it helps you be able to sleep. It helps you be able to breathe again. That's the idea of what this verse is saying. Merriness, a merry heart is supposed to be like for our souls. It's supposed to be like a medicine for our souls. Uh, to help us be able to breathe again. To help us be able to enjoy life again. To help us to be able to sleep again. When you have a broken spirit, those are the things you struggle with. You can't go to sleep. Your mind won't let you. It's hard to function throughout the day. You can't live life normally. Because you have a broken spirit that keeps you from functioning the way that you ought to. And the Bible says the best remedy for that is to have a merry heart. And as we've learned at the beginning of our message here today, that merry heart truly does come from the Lord. It truly does come from the Lord. So a merry heart will do you some good if you will allow the Lord to give it to you. A merry heart will do your sorrowful heart some good today. If you're struggling with missing a loved one, if you're struggling with having sorrow in your heart about a circumstance that's going on in your, in your family or your workplace, friend, a merry heart is the answer for you today. A merry heart will do good for your bitter, uh, do, do some good for your bitter heart as well today. You're struggling with anger towards someone else in your heart. One of the best remedies that I can tell you uh, that you can do to treat that type of bitterness in your heart is to replace it with the joy of Jesus. Put away the bitterness and embrace the forgiveness and joy that Jesus Christ alone can bring into your life. Amen. A merry heart is good like a medicine. Now on the flip side, listen to me, the Bible does say a broken spirit dries up the bones. On the flip side, if you continue with your brokenness, your woundedness, this broken spirit, it will suck the life out of you. It will eventually destroy you. How much better would it be to replace that sorrow, to replace that brokenness, to replace that woundedness with the joy that only Jesus can bring into your life? So I wonder, do you have a merry heart? Now, some people are able to endure some of the most difficult hardships in life because they have a merry heart. I have one more illustration and I'll be done here today. How many of you ever heard of evangelist John Bishop before? Have you heard of John Bishop before? John Bishop, uh, we got to meet this man. I got to meet this man when we lived in Tennessee when I was a youth pastor there. My wife knew him from before that. She used to go to the camp that this man started. But John Bishop, for much of his life, was a pastor. And he was a great preacher. He was a, 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 very, a, a very blessed pastor. God had used his ministry in a great way. Uh, in his life, but at some point, as a grown adult, he was diagnosed with a type of uh, spinal meningitis that literally completely brought him back to an adolescent state mentally. I'm talking about this spinal meningitis put him on his back, and he was like a little baby again. He didn't know how to talk. He, he didn't know. He forgot how to walk. He forgot everybody. He forgot his wife. He forgot his children. He forgot that he was a pastor. He forgot everything. He was like a little child. And this all happened to John Bishop and to his wife, I might say as well. And she stayed with him. And she had to not only raise her children, but she had to raise her husband. Now some of you say, well, all of us have to do that. <laughs> this is literally, okay? <laughs> she had to teach him 
how to use the bathroom. She had to teach him how to dress himself. She had to teach him how to talk. She had to educate him. Now, thankfully, he did learn a little bit faster than what a, a, a typical child would learn. But nonetheless, can you imagine going through that circumstance? This couple. And yet, I still remember the day we were at a we were visiting another church, and, and this man came up to me and shook my hand and had a little bit of a speech impediment. I figured something had happened to him uh, in his past. But boy, he's like one of the happiest guys I've ever met in my life. And she was too. And boy, they, they were just joyful. They were enjoy they were enjoyable to be around. And we went to this service, and lo and behold, I found out he was the man who was speaking at the church that day. I didn't know who it was going to be. And he got up to speak, and he told me his testimony, and my mind was blown away. Here's a man who had every right to be sorrowful at what he lost, every right to be angry at God, humanly speaking, every right to be down on himself, but he had joy in his heart that was unexplainable. How did he get there? His faith in Jesus Christ. So he would always say, I didn't have... I, I didn't believe in Jesus once. I've got to believe in Jesus twice. <laughs> he got to discover Christ twice. And he, he often talked about how, how much more joy he had in his heart because of that. I believe he's still living today. I think about that man. I think about his circumstance. I think about what he had to go through. And then I look at the joy that's still exuberating from his life. And I can't think of a better definition on this side of eternity of what a merry heart is really looks like. Do you have that kind of joy in your heart today? Are you really merry in your spirit? See, if you're going to be merry, that merriness will come from your relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're struggling with finding true joy in your heart today, can I propose to you, foundationally, the reason may be for you that you've never truly received Jesus Christ into your life as your Savior. That's the only place you're going to find true joy in your life, is in knowing Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you that's why Jesus came, that you could have this joy birthed inside your soul through believing in him as your Lord and Savior. There's never been a time when you trusted Christ as your Savior. Jesus Christ wants to save your soul today and give you a real reason in your heart to have this joy. And there's some of you, and I believe most of you in this room, you do have Christ in your heart. And yet we do struggle sometimes with having this joy in our lives too, don't we? No. The Bible's given us a definition of what it truly means to be, to be merry. It requires you to make the choice to be cheerful. It requires you to make the choice to be content. And then to make the choice to let this joy Jesus has placed in your heart be the cure no matter what circumstance you may be facing in your life. I wonder, Christian, would you be willing to allow the joy of Jesus to bring back this merriness to your heart today? You don't have to go out of this place saying, woe is me, my life's the worst. You can go out of this place realizing you're more blessed than you could ever deserve. You can go out of this place knowing the joy of Jesus in your heart afresh and anew. If you'd be willing to make that choice today. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Boy, a simple message. Not the message I thought I was going to preach. But I wonder. We say Merry Christmas. I know we're one day past it today. But I wonder if this will be the time.